Uh, good afternoon. Um, welcome to uh, our session on can diversity help save the oceans. Um, uh, we've got a great, great bunch here to um, um, to have uh, a chat amongst ourselves. And uh, really, we are looking at how everyone obsessed, obsessed with the big five species, salmon, cod, tuna and prawns. And uh, in the session now, we're going to explore whether um, eating a more diverse um, uh, group of species uh, can really, really help the oceans. So I'm going to throw over to uh, Caroline Bennett, um, who runs uh, Solar Discretion, uh, a brilliant, um, very innovative fish company down in uh, in Plymouth, uh, connecting people directly with uh, with fishermen. So, Caroline, what's your thoughts? On the diversity aspect of it, yeah. Um, I mean, as I don't suppose fisheries are particularly different from any other any other food product that we eat. I mean, apples, there are hundreds of species of apples and yet we tend to eat the, the big five. So it's a sort of universal way that the developed world has started to approach food. And I suppose because fish is still the last wild harvest, aquaculture we're forgetting about for this purpose but because it is still the last wild harvest it's it's not comparable to farming cattle or or farming agriculture um and yet we've ap approached it with all the same systems that we do for global industrial scale agriculture and, and cattle ranching so we're trying to fit the extraordinarily delicate ecosystem with a little bit of that and a little bit of that and a balance within that, we're trying to fit that square peg into a round hole of how we operate um, a, a global industrialized food system. And so much of what we take is based on what the fish processing side wants to produce rather than necessarily what the, the natural balance in the ecosystem is on any one day blessing us with. Um, so we'll be cherry picking from that. And of course, because it's not an agricultural thing where you can just sow for cod or just sow for haddock, in the process of harvesting the cod and the haddock, there are hundreds of species and tons of fish that get taken out of the sea um, at the same time with, with so much less regard for it. Um, but I wonder, Mitch and, and others on the panel, might, for me, that feels like that's as much our responsibility as processors as it is down to the consumer and certainly when I was growing up strawberries at Christmas wasn't available and it was only supermarkets that said okay well we can all eat strawberries at Christmas and suddenly everybody wants to eat strawberries at Christmas so so at what level is it because cod has a fantastic shelf life and therefore can can withstand the rigors of industrial scale processing um, how much is that dictated further down the line? What and how we take things out of the sea? Um, so for me living off, as you do Mitch and, 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 and Chris and Sanjay, we've all lived off the Southwest coast and seen the abundance of different species here. Um, but two of that and 10 of that and three of that doesn't really fit the processing world very neatly. And I would suggest that was one of the big reasons why we don't see the biodiversity in our fish um, fish selections. But I, but I think also, Caroline, I mean, I, we don't value the, I mean, let, let's talk about the big five. I mean, and why people like the big five. I mean, salmon, tuna and cod, why do people like them? It's easy to access. It's, you know, there, there's no bones in it. They, you know, it's, it's, a, it's very meaty. And <laughs> tuna in particular is such a versatile fish for, canning um, for the raw market, for the luxury market, all sorts. And when we think about those those species that have been so overexploited over the years, you know, Pacific tuna, that kind of thing, um, salmon uh, is all farmed. I mean, you know, we, we've gone through, and certainly in my lifetime, I remember selling uh, an abundance of wild salmon in the early days when I opened my first fish shop. And I don't think I've seen a wild salmon for the last four or five years. So I've actually witnessed that in my time, that, that kind of goes, so we rely on farmed fish and, and cod, and I think some of this comes down to education in terms of people sort of valuing what other species are out there that we, we just shouldn't be catching these, 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 these big species in such quantities. And we should be, you know, valuing the other species, too, for sure. I, mean, I wonder if, Chris, are you up for talk? Because Chris runs a fantastic farmers in the farmers market. He runs a fantastic fish 
store in, in Truro. And his experience, from what I understand, is very different in terms of the, the diversity of the fish that he sells and the interest from the people that he sells to. So yeah. can I talk a little bit around that? Hello, Mitch. Hi. I've arrived at my, uh, my position by default, really, because uh, the five species that I mentioned, the big five, are, are not part of my... Uh, my selling uh, uh, species at all. We have we get the odd cod. That's all. Mm -hmm. Most of those species have moved further west or north. The cod and the haddock are both out of range for an under ten meter boat now, We're working from where I am. And so we have by default developed the um, markets for all the other species we catch, and we are able to sell everything that comes aboard the boat. Everything that it's possible it comes aboard the boat we have a market for and we've developed those markets by just encouraging customers to move away from the big five and try something else and encourage them with recipes or uh, cheap preparations and and so on so that's uh, where we are with i'm able to sell three or four hundred kilos of fish go away and carry our bags from the farmer's market none of which are the big five which you talk about which is great. And I, I think supermarkets have been, you know, over the years have been driving the, 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 you know, the big five species, because when you think about tuna and salmon, they're incredibly uh, versatile in terms of their shelf life handling, the, the way they're prepared and they come in, whereas the more sort of diverse species of rays and, and, and gurnards and smaller flatfish need a little bit more skill to handle and process and, uh, and perhaps knowledge to be able to sell them. So I think, and Caroline, uh, your business is fascinating. It'd be really interesting to explain to viewers how that works, because I think it's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's unique in, in its sense that you're putting fishermen and, uh, and small, 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 small scale fishermen directly in touch with the consumer. Yeah, well, it was all Chris's fault. Um, so I, I met Chris in 2004, I think at the same time, possibly he was in the Sanjay at Terra Madre, Slow Foods Terra Madre. And at that time, I, I had a, I have a Japanese restaurant and he said, oh, I can I can send you a, a box of fish. And I thought, well, how is this one man band going to send me this box of fish? And sure enough, within a week of being back in Britain, he'd sent this extraordinary box of fish that when you opened the box, I mean, we all know the, the smell of a a fresh fish box. It smells sweet and, and alluring. It smells of the sea. And I still remember the, the look of the chefs, like they were expecting to, to have the usual stench of fish come out of this box. And it was none of that. It was this beautiful sweetness that comes from the sea. And, and in it were these species that we just hadn't come across. Like, I mean, they sound really old hat now, but like Gernard um, and Rass, um, what else do we have in there? Breams, yeah. mullets. I mean, he just sent a whole range of species that hitherto our chefs hadn't appreciated and that, that they even existed in, in Britain. And I suppose if it, it's all down to the, the value that we place on something, isn't it? A fisherman won't look after his fish if he knows he's going to get a low price for something. So in some ways, it's up to the to the consumer to say, well, OK, I will divert my money to to, to, to species that will then lift that value. Um, and I think to some extent, the restaurant supply chain through the likes of Chris supplying into them and, and many others now had sort of found their, their niche. And I'm sure Sanjay would, would talk to that point as well. But if you were a retailer or you're sitting at home and you wanted to eat fish that wasn't going to be knowingly damaging the environment then how did you go about it so that's why i set up solar of discretion and it, and it essentially does a few things one of which is pay a fair price to the fishermen irrespective of the species so of course we're not going to pay turbot prices for pouting but nonetheless the pouting is still given a value um, for that they need to, to take care of the fish so they need to potentially gut it but certainly ice it and then we process it, which sounds, of course, very, very obvious. But if you take a beautiful pouting or a beautiful gurnard and you and you you process it within 24 hours of catch and you ice it down and either if you haven't fro uh, sold it, you put it in the freezer, it's blast frozen. Um, this incredibly lovely, relatively good value fish, pouting or ras or whatever it might be, is a delicious, quality, nutritious um fillet from a local fisherman 
um, that, that, that ticks all the boxes in terms of being environmentally sensitively caught because we take only from the under 10 meter boats, which is the government's definition of small scale. And I think all of us around here could discuss the environmental impact of that, but for want of a better one, we only go for the under 10s. And then we trace back to the boat. So it gives you the method of catch. Um, so whether it's trawled or netted or line caught, it will tell you exactly how that fish was, was, was caught. Um, and then it'll tell you also, I think quite transparently in this world of smoke and mirrors, the production day and the day it was caught. So often when you're getting a fresh fish, it could be 10 days old, it could even be 14 days old, it could even be worse, right? We don't, we don't know because there's no legal obligation to, to mention that. Um, whereas we're transparent about what we do. And as I say, if we haven't sold it within 24 hours of catching it, we, we stick it in our glass freezer. Um, and that's the only way that you can really guarantee a continuity of supply in the last few days, for example, where it's been blowing a gale down here uh, and you've really needed to be able to look at the resource of the freezer and say, yep, here we have a continu continuous supply of fish from the small scale vessels. Um, and that, that, that ticks that demand from the retailers that need continuity of supply. I believe also that the, it's necessary to maximize the value of the resource. That's that's where I'm coming from, and I think by you know educating the the fishermen with ice slush tubs, short soak times if they're gill netting, and getting fish in and landed within you know six or eight hours of it being caught, this is this is the way forward to maintain a resource in good shape because you're only taking a little bit of this and that, and uh, I think that type of attitude the, the the stock will carry on for a long time. Yeah, I, th I think it's fascinating how during, I think during lockdown, um, how people's attitudes changed to sort of buying online and how that sort of accelerated people's uh, relationship with the internet and trust in, in, in a big way, probably by a decade. And um, I think many online, online sort of <clears throat> not just seafood businesses were, uh, were born, which has been, uh, which has been fabulous. And I, I strongly believe that, you know, for a long time, having been a, been a fishmonger since 96 and experienced my own sort of uh, wastage and seeing how, you know, bigger retailers would would have wastage. That that the only way for us to enjoy seafood in the future is in a direct supply chain from fishermen uh, directly to people's doors. Because we need to um, we need to behave. We we, we need um, really good practice on land as as much as sea to su support sustainability. And uh, and when I start seeing fish going to a supply chain uh, that is that, that is wasted, I I, I think it's uh, I think it's frightening. And uh, it really is. And Sanjay, you've had a um, you've had a big love of uh, sardines, and yes, uh, it's hard to uh, promote that, which I think is brilliant. Do, do, do you want to tell us all about that? Absolutely. Uh, good afternoon, all. It's a pleasure to be a part of this conversation. Fish is a slippery subject, and I'm quite honoured uh, that I could get a chance as a Bengali to come down to Cornwall uh, and discover this amazing uh, product, this amazing historic fish, sardine. And I set up a mobile cookery school based on it called the School of Cornish Sardines. Sardines, or should we say pilchard stress to be grammatically correct, uh, is, is, has been and is a lifeline of a lot of cuisines around the world. And in Cornwall especially, I got a chance to discover the history of it and how it fed people through, uh, you know, scarcity. I mean, there is a variety of fish that is landed in Cornwall, but sardine has had its own share of history and uh, take, for instance, the example of Stari Gezi pie. Uh, you have two uh, or many uh, pilchards sticking out of a fish pie. And that was an inspiration that gave me a chance to travel around Cornwall and inspire people right from the grassroots of old age homes to schools, to fishermen's children, to, to places where fish is really consumed in volume. I, I work as a chef in a restaurant and in hotels. and the influence and the impact that we can make on consumers who eat fish is, is, is a part of a big pie chain. But just as we are talking about Chris or the market, the whole market, there's a big opportunity. And that's what we looked at, how we can inspire people right from the grassroots, right from the children to, um, to whole across the spectrum, how people can uh, you know, adapt to eating something like sardines. 
generally when you talk talk about sardines people say oh my god it's got a lot of bones how am i going to eat it but it has been the food of sustenance food of the uh, poor yet uh, you talk about italian cucina povera or uh, you talk about all sorts of uh, cuisines starting from portugal to around the world in philippines in southern uh, hemisphere in africa in india there are different names for sardine but it has been a very uh, crucial and integral part of cuisines around the world and i was uh, and i am continuously quite lucky in terms of how we can exploit this small fish to punch above its weight and feed the uh, feed the world really and its imagination fascinating sanjay uh, um bryce um tell us, tell us a bit about breaking out of the big 5 Yes, uh, thanks, Mitch, and good to finally be here. Many apologies to you guys and all of the audience. Um, I had technical problems, which I still don't know how they happened, but I'm I'm via somebody's phone in New Zealand at the moment, even though I'm in the UK. Uh, yeah, so I had planned originally um, to give a, a, a short presentation at the start of this session. Um, obviously, I can't do that at the moment. But I'll just sort of go through it. So obviously we've got this situation with the big five, um, some uh, really nice um, work that I saw recently by the Plymouth Fishing and Seafood Association has produced um, information cards on actually how many different types of species are caught around the UK. And it's they've got 90 species on their um, charts it's probably around 100 altogether, but obviously we're focused on these big five. The other thing I wanted to bring in was the concept of, um, oh, there we go. Thank you very much. The magic of the internet. I didn't even do anything then. Um, yeah, the other thing I wanted to bring in was what's on the, the second last slide, which is this idea of balanced harvesting. So I know a lot of the focus today is about eating a broader range of species. But we should think about that in terms of a broader range of size of fish as well, because in the ocean, in fact, in most food webs, they tend to take a pyramid shape. So you have most of the biomass, the sort of primary producers, be it things like grass on the plains or phytoplankton in the sea, um, at the very base of the food chain. And then it, it, it sort of tapers up from there so that at the top of the food chain you have the predators now humans for probably obvious reasons have uh, long tended to focus on wanting to consume the biggest species because um, obviously you get the sort of most bang, bang for your buck in terms of uh, each fish you catch but that's the opposite to what um, we find in nature and so by sort of taking out a lot of those top level fish, what you're actually doing is destabilizing ecosystems. And you can see all sorts of consequences from that, um, including things like the proliferation of disease or parasites or just um, rapid changes in, in species composition. So I'm involved in this new project called Pyramids of Life. It's a collaboration between University of York, where I am, uh, CFAS, the Government Fisheries Labs, um, also Sea uh, Fish, uh, Waitrose, um, the Scottish, Scottish Pelagic Fishermen Association, uh, and a number of others. And where uh, we've got everyone from mathematicians to obviously industry and retailers looking at this idea of can we actually um, harvest fish in a more balanced way? And that is both in terms of size and species. It's clearly challenging, and I know I've unfortunately missed the start of this conversation, but, um, you know, British consumers tend to be very, very conservative. Um, and so we're working with both environmental psychologists, but also people like Waitrose to look at ways that we might be able to nudge consumers to, um, you know, to be more adventurous and to, to think about it sustainability in this broader sense. So I'm not somebody on the coal face, if you like, you know, I'm not, um, I'm not catching or trying to sell fish, but I am very interested in these issues. I guess, I don't know if this has been discussed already, but um, one thing I've sort of wondered about is what 
some of you guys might have learned from the situation during COVID and how um, a lot of fishermen and, and producers and retailers had to get a bit more creative in terms of how they sold their fish. I know there was um, an increase in sort of um, boat to door uh, production, if you like. So is anyone able to comment on that and maybe what you learned from that experience? Uh, possibly Caroline, I'm imagining you had to deal with that among others. Sure, yeah, we, we were actually in a perfect position because that's all we've ever done. So we've right. only ever done retail ready pack. So you've got a pack of fish that you can take home for dinner for two. Literally, you unpack it. It's all filleted. We've done all the hard work for you. Stick it under grill. Five, ten minutes later, you've got a perfectly delicious, nutritional piece of locally landed fish. Um, so we didn't have to change anything in COVID other than thankfully and gratefully up our volumes. Um, but I think that people will absolutely eat lesser known species and particularly our fantastic um, non-British contingent living in Britain. Mm. We are far more familiar with, you know, the Europeans, um, Asians, uh, Africans. They are far more adapted to eating good fish. And I think if you've got a reputation for only delivering fresh quality fish, then then it, it, people will try anything that they that you trust them with. Um, and I, you know, yeah, I think that's what you're right. Yeah. Yeah. So they will eat pouting. They will eat dogfish. They will right. eat cats if it's been well handled, well treated, and put into a pack that makes it easy for them to consume. Why not? Why just stick with cod? It's sure. Too Take horse mackerel, for example. Um, I was at a fisheries meeting four or five years ago, and I realized that uh, the under 10s don't even have a quota for catching horse mackerel because it's, right. it's a quota of species. And so they turned around to me, the uh, MMO, and said, uh, well, how much do you want? I said, well, what about half a ton to start with? And so it's stuck at half a ton ever since. Uh -huh. Because I asked for it, it's now on the allocation for the under 10s. And we catch uh, horse mackerel as a, um, a bycatch, if you like, when we're hook and line catching jumbo mackerel or other species. And we sell it on the markets. And I've got a huge number of customers now that will switch from mackerel to horse mackerel according to which is the most available. And it's, it's brilliant. just been put in ice slurry the moment it's been caught. And I can fillet them and take off the scooticles and you know, like Portuguese customers and Filipino customers, it's, that's absolutely perfect for them. That's what they what they used to. And what does a horse mackerel uh, taste like compared to a, a regular mackerel? I, I I don't think there's a lot of difference. I, right. I, I take the scooters off, fillet them for customers, and then the, take the line of pin bones off down the middle. So they got four four sections, and the ones that we sell are are the fairly big ones, and those grill perfect. Customers say they couldn't really uh, uh, fault them uh, compared with a normal mackerel. They were just as good. Right. Tasting goes, and it's a, it's a bit cheaper too for the consumer. Okay, and obviously you know very nutritious, full of uh, omega three fatty oils and all that sort of good stuff. Um. So did you see like a, a you know an uptick in business during COVID or? Um... So, yes, we started a door to door delivery system because the fish that uh, I sell comes from my boat, from my own boat. And if we, without auctions and without the restaurant trade, that boat would have to tie up. So we had to do something. And so we mm -hmm. put emails around to as many customers that we knew their email addresses of and started a door-to-door -door delivery. And that made up the difference. We started off with just uh, doing two or three days a week and then the farmer's markets reopened. They were shut down for a while and during COVID. And uh, so what, what were the farmers markets reopening and people wanting to shop outside and our door to door deliveries once or twice a week, our business uh, actually gained volume. And my boat, okay. my boat could fish five days a week. I mean, that's brilliant, isn't it? Um, I guess two questions really, and, and maybe for you guys or anyone else who wants to pitch in, but you mentioned about not having quota as an under 10 and, um, I'm I'm thinking about how we can scale up this kind of thing because, you know, to really make a difference in terms of sustainability, we do need 
you know, many more businesses doing the sort of thing that, that you guys are doing. Um, but that, I guess, is held back to some extent by, you know, ha actually having access to, to quota or maybe supply chains and things like that um, that can get, you know, can get that bigger and, uh, variety of fish to market or to consumers, really. Well, most of the most of the species we bring aboard the boat are now non non quota species. Okay, we have we have a quota on bass. I agree, but uh, and there's not enough cod to be worthwhile thinking about for quota. The pollock quota is huge. So we don't have to worry anymore about quota. We used to have to worry about it with soles and cod, but the 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 sole quota has increased now for the small boats. Cod's not available. Haddock is too far away so we're yeah not, we're really our hands are not tied anymore now for quota okay so i mean that's good certainly um i'm seeing lots of comments come up in the uh in the chat but i can't i'm just on the phone so i can't really keep up with them but um yeah i know jerry percy was offering some <laughs> gems of wisdom as he often does uh but yeah so we still i guess we have two problems one is how do we scale this up? Because one thing I've noticed both you've said and, and I think Mitch said earlier as well is that, yes, you are able to sell these different species, but they're often going to your Portuguese customers or your French customers or your Korean or um, uh, who, of course, you know, are British, part of the rich diversity of people we have here. But um, yeah, how can we how can we get uh even more different people to try these species but what I, is holding them back yeah come, uh, over to you mitch i think one of the biggest problems for for, for years has been that supermarkets have dominated the retail space so right. really, if you wanted to buy fish in the uk you would you, you predominantly would go to a supermarket and that's where the big five are being promoted and done fabulous independent fishmongers around you know i've had fishmongers for for a numbers of years and and those guys do an amazing job but sadly the fishmongery business is in decline. I think the online business, the age of the online business is, is, is here and it's the way we should be buying our seafood. And, you know, during lockdown, we have an interest in a small day boat and we landed it on the quay in Brixham, you know, rather rather like um, Caroline and um, and the guys there. We landed on the on the quay side and, you know, the catch would have probably fetched about, you know, a few hundred quid on the market at that time. We were able to treble the value of the catch by selling it directly, mm. turning up with bags and boxes. And, and and I think what the online world does is allows people full access to the species that are available. So we run an online business as well. And with, with, within hours of, you know, bringing it from bricks and marking and putting it up online, <laughs> people are able to access dabs, gurnards, you know, whiting pouts, all the fish that a supermarket just wouldn't buy. And, uh, and I think that if the, if the supply chain can be open to people, then then people will consume it. But if you can't buy it, then then that's been that's been one, one of the one of the big challenges. So I think I think it's really about availability, making fish available um, okay. directly. People is, is really important. Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely know what you mean. I mean, you go into a supermarket and there does tend to be a certain sort of limited choice promoted. Um, and so maybe what we need is a bit of a, a multi pronged approach whereby yes try and grow these online um supply chains but also try and influence the supermarkets as well and there's been little bits of it over the years hasn't there but um you know it it seems to sort of be a little trend that pops up for a while and then we go back to business as usual i get really passionate about this price in terms of you know the elephant in the room for big retailers is wastage and uh yeah. some I'm never going to quote is how much fish they waste and you know e even running a small fish counter you realize what waste is left at the end you imagine that on scale of several hundred stores and also the, the supply chain it has to go through to to get to a supermarket clunky long-winded uh you know often sold by somebody that's not an expert on the counter and then of course it's the only product you buy from a supermarket that gets worse by the time you get it home so so you buy it, walk around you pick the kids up from school you know you get home you pop it in the fridge and by the time you eat it the product's worse and uh, and I don't think that we're 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 in a stage that we can afford to allow that waste to go on. And uh, and I, and I really love the idea of a zero waste supply chain that Caroline runs, that we run, where you you know what you don't sell on the day, you blast freeze for another day, so that you know when the weather's poor, catches are low, things are not in season, you've got you've got fish, but you you cannot have a supply chain with waste in it. I think I, I feel really really passionate and strongly that that is something that we on land can 
can, can deal with and, uh, and make it easy. And in that way, we can, we, you know, people are able to buy all of the catch. You know, I mean, if, if you land, if you've got a fishmonger shop and you land, you know, half a ton of horse mackerel, uh, fantastic, you've got it. But nobody's going to walk through the door on that day and buy half yeah. a ton. You need to freeze it for the for the days to be able to, to um, uh, and also offer it out and, and freeze it for the days when, when when you haven't got anything else. No, I mean I'm absolutely with you on in terms of reducing waste. I mean not only from obviously an ethical point of view, but if we think about things like well food food security, food poverty, but also climate change, that is a huge contributor to to climate change is waste in general. Um, food waste and of you know with waste of other commodities as well so you know if we're getting serious about a more circular economy this is this has got to be the way to go uh, it reminded me of a little story of um an unnamed supermarket chain where i got chatting to the person behind the counter and obviously fish counters make a thing of of, of having a lot of variety on them quite often um but, uh, and this particular one I know used to have octopus on it. And I, I was chatting to the, the guy there and, and he said, yeah, most of what's on here we throw away. And he oh. said, I've never, I've never sold an octopus. And yet any day of the week you could go in and see octopus on that fish counter. And, I, you know, I just thought that was tragic. Um, and so that to me means that they need to be doing a better job of trying to promote those different species. But there seemed to be this acceptance that, you know, yes, we could make the counters look interesting, but we'd still just keep selling the same stuff. Um, yeah, it's not really good enough, is it? Not good enough. I mean, if it doesn't taste good, nobody's going to buy it a second time. And I think that's the problem with the supermarkets. They're dominated by these industrial scale supply chains and they don't lend themselves to the ecosystem's ability to produce a bit of that, a bit of that and a bit of that. Yeah. Um, so this, the, the freshness thing becomes a real issue but as as Mitch says the wastage is just colossal um, mm -hmm. and I think you know like like so many of the solutions to the, the bigger agricultural problem it, it, it's scale we need to take out this industrialization massive um, one species on the production line at any one time supplying into a bigger supply chain of, of supermarkets to well, okay, Waitrose in Sussex will be buying different fish to Waitrose in Scotland or Durham or wherever. Um, and I, I think that's got to happen at a much more localized level. And it could still be um, a case of the smaller fishermen working together to produce this variety of, of, of fish and species that could then be sold on as, a, as an amalgamated diverse range of species. Um, but the, the, the supermarkets have to be much less prescriptive about, I want 100 kilos of that and 100 kilos of that. It's got to be more like, what have you got? We'll take it. Yeah. yeah. And, and I know that, you know, if we had someone from the supermarket here, they'd probably tell us why that's difficult for their business model. I guess I would say their business model needs to change, but um, it does because otherwise yeah. there'll be no fish left in the sea. I mean, it's well, so and and you know many of the other issues that the planet faces. I, I'm just wondering if if uh, we could hear some more from Sanjay and um, you know his experiences and perspectives. Thank you, uh, sir. I mean, I I strongly believe that education is the key to changing the the whole perspective about what to eat and what not to eat, and and. Like charity, education begins at home. My daughter, yeah. for instance, who is eight or nine, goes to the school and the only fish that is available to her in the school meal, which she predominantly eats, is fish fingers and fish and chips. Now, this is where if we start uh, roping in the idea that fish fingers and fish and chips is not just cod and haddock, but there is also a variety that can be introduced, uh, like the hidden vegetables. Supermarkets, we are going back to that. They have a massive power in influencing what people eat and not eat in this country or anywhere in the world because they have got the buying power, they have got the audience, and they also have the, uh, the information boards. They have got the message board where they can really change what people eat. For instance, in the last few years, if you look at the shelves of vegetables, uh, wonky vegetables have been introduced in every supermarket. And it is mm -hmm. definitely going off the shelf because people who want to uh, have a bit of an uh, uh, experience or do, who want to buy cheaper who, or who want to not waste food are buying those wonky carrots or potatoes which are a bit greener or or any other vegetables and they are sitting on the same shelf as 
better quality, all straight, all orange looking carrots. So change can come from within. Change can come from big decision makers. So I strongly believe that if we can influence the grassroots and, and the school levels and the places where children are good examples of example setters for the whole family. And then if a child comes, um, comes uh, back home and says, mom or dad, I really tried a new dish, which was made with uh, a horse mackerel as a fish finger. Uh, what surprises me a lot, sir, is that we only as, as uh, Western uh, civilization or as British citizens like to eat exotic food only when we go on holiday. It's very strange. We, we love to eat sardines <laughs> uh, stuffed with mozzarella, uh, bread crumb deep fried in Italy, but we don't want to do that when we are at home because it has got too much bones in it. Yeah, what, a, yeah. what a surprising thing to have. So, no, so I, I totally education agree. starts at home and this is where we need to start teaching people from the grassroots. Uh, supermarkets can uh, spend a bit of their marketing money and influence people to say, look, you're uh, like Mitch was saying, or as Carolyn has, let's say I saw during the, pand uh, during the uh, height of the pandemic, people going into the supermarket and picking up a celery act. They don't know what to do with it. As a yeah. chef, I'm dying to make a nice fondant out of it, but they picked it up because that's the only vegetable left on the shelf to buy. It's All our right. role as educators to teach them how to use that bit of vegetable and eat for a long time because it goes a long way. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and that's where fish comes into the, uh, to the picture. Uh, I can see some comments that some supermarkets have closed their fish counters, but those are the real, uh, should I say, point of sales from where uh, education can be uh, shouted out loud and people can be taught to make things uh, go the distance. Fish is one, uh, uh, Mitch is a strong believer in this, fish is one source of protein that can be eaten from uh, nose to tail. Everything can be used up yeah. and, and it stays, uh, it can be stretched. I mean, on the first day, you could possibly turn a fish into a nice fillet, the rest of the bone, the rest of the cheeks, things like that can be turned into another dish, a fish stock, and that's where it goes. I come from Bengal and no bit of fish is thrown in our house. Even the fish yeah. eggs are turned into fish cakes. The oil is, uh, my ma say, mother says, machet tele mach bhaja fish, uh, frying fish in fish's oil. And that's where I think education is the key to changing the perspective about how we can save fish for generations to come. I think that's a brilliant point. Thank you very much, Sanjay. We've just got a couple minutes left. Um, so I'm just gonna ask for any final comments from the, uh, from the other panelists, but yeah, sounds like we need a campaign for wonky fish or something. <laughs> So I'll just cross to you, um, Caroline and and uh, and Chris, just for any very final points you would like to make. We've just got about two minutes left. Can I make the point about wastage there to uh, address uh, Mitch's concern? We don't waste anything from our boat at all on the market. I even take the guts and gills out of the fish like whiting, pollock, cod, or whatever we have to have. And I put that in a clean morn down beneath the, the counter. And then when someone comes and wants to make fish stock, I haul it out. It's got no guts, no scales on it, clean and, and, and already gilled. And those, those same customers will bring, bring us a gift next week. So I'm turning, turning waste into, into a product. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, thank you. And anything, uh, final comment from you, Caroline? Um, I'd just say that you... Know, know your fisherman, um, know where your fish was caught, know how it was caught, know the method of catch. Um, and I think that's a good good start to um, being able to, to, to navigate your way through a very difficult market. And just because something is local doesn't make it necessarily low impact on the environment. Sure. I think that's something in Britain we really need to take on board. Okay, thank you very much. And we'll just go to Mitch for the very last word. <laughs> oh, um, I think Caroline's just wrapped it up. I think uh, I, I, I feel that we have a, um, a fabulous fishery in the southwest or along, along the south coast. I feel that we have some of the, the best fish in the world in, in the UK. And, uh, and I think it's worth getting online and, and hooking up with fishermen and, uh, and, and time to enjoy it because there's tons of great stuff out there. There's never been a better time.
Excellent. And I love the fish pun there at the end, hooking up with fishermen. Yeah, okay, it. thank you so much, everyone. And to everyone who's tuned in, apologies again that I was a little late to the party, but I'm, I'm glad I made it. And uh, yeah, it was great to have a fascinating chat with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bryce.